I will now recognize myself for an ongoing um, uh, of this hearing for an opening statement. We're here today on May 20th, 2021, when throughout America, states have rates of death by guns of 12, 15, 22% of our population. America still remains as the battlefront of guns. The state of Texas, the governor just signed a permitless law that anyone without the permission of that business, that church, a doctor's office, that school, at least by perceived by the public, whatever fine points have been made, the public doesn't read it. They just say it's a free for all. In the backdrop of the tragedy of El Paso, 22 of our fellow Texans were killed because someone said they didn't like Mexicans. So today the subcommittee turns to the all too commonplace tragedy that is gun violence. In the time since our committee last held a hearing focused on gun violence, many more Americans' lives have been heartbreakingly and unnecessarily lost to gunfire. Current circumstances have exacerbated the problem. During the pandemic, gun sales have surged with more children at home with firearms that have not been properly secured. As late or as many years back, when I served on the Houston City Council, the first gun law they ever passed was the requirement that parents would be responsible for securing their guns because two-year-olds were being shot by guns that they found in the home. On top of these frightening dynamics, there has been an uptick in firearm fuel violent crime that has left families and communities torn and afraid. Statistics are sobering. On average, 316 people are shot every day, with over 100 killed and 64 dying by suicide. What about a city that lives through drive-by shootings, rage on the road? They don't wave their fists. They shoot out the window. They shoot seven-year-olds, two-year-olds, elderly persons, mothers, fathers, families. While official numbers have not been compiled, one study found that gun homicides and non-suicide related shootings took approximately 19,000 lives, 25% increase from 2019. Texas had over 3,000 deaths. The same study on gun deaths estimates that likely exceeded 40,000. This grim number would mean that 2020 had the highest rate of gun deaths in the last two decades. Each one of these deaths leaves a hole in the fabric of their family and community, and particularly our children. As with so many other tragedies, children often bear the brunt of gun violence. On a daily basis, eight children are victims of fa family fire due to an improperly stored or misused gun in their home. Today, guns account for half of all suicide death. That should appall us so much. In the majority of children's gun suicides, the guns were stored in the child's place of residence or the residence of a relative or friend. Yes, child suicides with guns. We cannot allow this to continue in our country. That is why safe storage of guns is critical to our public safety and why I introduced the Kimberly Vaughn Firearm Safe Storage Act. My bill would regulate the proper storage of firearms and ammunition for residences with children under the age of 18 or a residence with a person who is ineligible to own a firearm. I hope members will join me in co-sponsor this life-saving legislation. And I hope members from both sides of the aisle. I also hope that members of this committee will answer President Biden's call to address community violence through intervention and health infrastructure investment. We're delighted that this Congress voted to allow the Centers for Disease Control to establish gun violence as a national health issue. We must pursue creative solutions to the problem of gun violence on our streets and in our neighborhoods and in every part of this country in all too frequent basis. Another threat to our communities that we will discuss today is ghost guns. Ghost guns are firearms constructed with component parts that can be obtained anonymously without a background check and lack serial numbers. Ghost guns are essentially untraceable. The absence of a manufacturing record serial number or background check is essentially exactly what makes them the perfect guns to commit 
crimes. These weapons, ghost guns, pose a new and growing threat to the safety of our brave men and women of law enforcement. I didn't state earlier that the Texas law enforcement were against permitless guns. I think if you're for law enforcement, you gotta be for law enforcement. Increasingly, gangs, drug dealers, and other nefarious individuals are assembling their own untraceable firearms for their illicit activity. In 2020 alone, the Los Angeles Police Department recovered more than 600 ghost guns, at least 231 of which were used in serious or violent crimes such as murder and attempted murder and kidnapping, and 145 of which were recovered from felons who are prohibited from owning or possessing guns. Ghost guns are a clear and present threat to public safety, and it is imperative that we take action now. We cannot continue to live in a society where we uh, where you could be a victim to gun violence just by going to the school, the movies, uh, the musical festivals, and even grocery shopping. I'm committed to ending the scourge of gun violence in this country. And for many who are in this room, uh, some of us were here as Columbine hit the nation, and the commitment then was to stop gun violence. We must do more to address what is an issue of life and death for far too many Americans. We must complete this work and we have started on legislation that we know will work. Therefore, I call on the Senate to now pass the bipartisan background check and Charleston loophole bills passed out of this House under the leadership of Chairman Nadlin. I urge the Senate to pass the Violence Against Women Act, which contains a provision that would bar, position, uh, bar uh, the use of a firearm for those who are convicted of a misdemeanor stalking. I was glad to lead that bill uh, as it came out of this committee. At the same time, we're in the House, must consider additional legislation to provide common sense solutions to the scourge of gun violence and suicides. That is why our discussion will be so important today. But this discussion, members, and I thank you for your presence here, should be a call to action and a call to do. We must do and we have to do it now. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses on these critical issues, and it certainly is my pleasure now to recognize uh, the ranking member's opening statement. Mr. Biggs, you're recognized for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning. Good morning to you. Thank you very much. 